Okay, and we're back. Yeah. So this is our fourth session of the day. And uh, this afternoon, we're going to discuss about critical care medicine. And for this session, I would like to invite big names. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Xiang Luis Feng Song from Belgium. Hello, good morning. <laughs> Professor Hello, Yenu. good morning. Uh, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> yes, 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 we can hear you. And the second speaker is Professor Luciano Gattinoni from Germany. And last but not least is Professor Martin Vospal from Germany as well. And for this session, I would like to invite Dr. Aino from Indonesia to lead this session. Please, Aino. Thank you so much, Dr. Keisha, for the introduction. We would like to thank uh, Dr. Susilo and Dr. Eddie also for organizing this uh, session. We are very happy. We have three prominent speakers, which I believe was also here last year. Thank you for coming back, Professor Fang San, Professor Westphal, and Professor Gattinoni. We hope everything is okay with the current situation in Europe right now. We have uh, three lectures coming up from all speakers. I would like to invite the first speaker, Professor Jean-Louis Fonsan, if you don't mind to start the first presentation. And while you are preparing, um, maybe I can share uh, your CV, just a little bit introduction. Uh, professor Fonsan is a professor in the University of Brussels, has been the past president of many uh, in in intensive care medicine societies, including the World Federation and the European uh, Society for Intensive Care Medicine. Many publications, especially regarding uh, critical care, has been the editor-in-chief for also for critical care and current opinion in critical care. Today, he will be talking about the surviving sepsis guidelines, um, the good and the less good. So the time is yours, please. Uh, you can begin, Professor Hansan. Thank you and hello, hello. Uh, I'm sorry that we cannot meet. Uh, I think people are getting a bit fed up of these uh, video conferences, but uh, hopefully we will meet again um, very soon. Now, I hope you can uh, see my slides, maybe not. Maybe so, not, maybe not. not yet. I think you have to reshare. Yeah, but uh, I thought I was sharing. Uh, yeah. Now it is on, slides. but not yet on. Yes, now it is on. So you, you, you can see them now, yeah? Yes, very good. Very good. So, yeah, I would like to take a little bit of distance and raise the point, what is good, what is less good with the uh, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. And I have no conflict of interest, except that I have been member of the committee since the very beginning. And I think it's essential to develop guidelines. So I'm not against guidelines, no way. You can read the paper we wrote, John Marshall and I, a while ago, saying it's important to summarize principles of management but guidelines are not truth. It's a summary of what we think is adequate at time of publication of the guidelines. And so it helps the busy clinician who has no time to follow the literature or the less experts. And just applying the guidelines is not enough. Otherwise, everybody could treat sepsis. And guidelines guide management. They do not dictate what to do, and they do not replace the doctor. So I think this is a very important principle. I like to read guidelines about lung cancer, about leukemia, about things I'm not expert in. But I do not need, personally, guidelines to treat a patient with sepsis. But guidelines are important for others, those who are on call who may not know much about it. So let's go back to history, because I am very proud of uh, starting it more than 20 years ago. 
with the International Sepsis Forum, which is a collaborative effort between industry and academia. And at that time, we were just nine people meeting in Brussels to write the first guidelines over a weekend. Very simple. The guidelines were published in intensive care medicine and they were very, very popular. To the extent that the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and the American Society of Critical Care Medicine wanted to join. And we were three societies building the surviving sepsis campaign. I didn't like everything there, especially the Barcelona declaration, we will kill sepsis, it will disappear. Of course, it will not disappear. I didn't like that. But I love the guidelines, of course. How could I say otherwise? And uh, I didn't like the bundles, but that I will touch on that at the end of my presentation. And there were some criticism about the grants we received from the industry. Although these companies had no, nothing to say whatsoever in the development of uh, our guidelines. But we continued, 2004, 13 others. Then uh, the SCCM in particular, wanted to enroll almost every single intensive care society in the process. I was reluctant. I didn't want to have too many people involved. I didn't think it was a good idea because it makes the process more complex. And so in 2008, we were 55 experts. And then uh, 59 authors, that's me. We were many. How can you reach a consensus when there are so many people around? And now it's 60 authors. And some people believe that the larger the number of authors, the better it is. I don't think so. For the European guidelines on trauma management, we are 13. And it works very well. We don't need to have too many people because otherwise there is always someone who disagrees with what you propose. And so this is the first hurdle. You may think a large number of experts increases objectivity, increases validity, but it could make it more complicated. And the second thing is that the surviving services campaign wanted to involve low and middle income countries. I don't think so. I, they can participate, but to make guidelines applicable in uh, low or middle income countries is not a good idea because you may limit yourself. If you say that there is no need to measure procalcitonin, you will not have it available in your country because the hospital managers, and the key political leaders will read it. They will say, okay, well, they recognize you don't have it. So don't complain. You know, uh, the, 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 the prolonged infusion of beta-lactams, oh, it's not possible in our country. But ask for it. Just say, these are the guidelines, so we need to get there. Instead of saying, oh, it's not possible in my country. Ah, oh, no, I cannot do this, I cannot do that. That's not how you will make progress. So that's another big problem that we did not have before. And of course, the third element is when you really want to apply evidence-based medicine, multicentric, prospective, randomized, controlled trials, targeting mortality in septic patients, everything is negative. We have no positive trials. We have many, many trials published in the New England Journal, in JAMA, but 
there is no effect on mortality. Swan Gans cut it there, no. Uh, activated protein C, no. Early versus late initiation of renal replacement therapy, no. Statin administration, LDS, no. Antioxidants, no. Albumin, no. Transfusions, no. No, no, no. No difference in outcome. And so people can be extremely critical. And whenever you propose something, people can say it has not been shown to decrease mortality. And that's how we now prepare the guidelines, not by discussions among experts. People are before their computer, their screen. And they look at this, uh, is there any evidence? So my colleagues and I, and I, we raise the question, is there any positive randomized control trial? And we published it in Critical Care Medicine recently. And we showed that there are very few things which have been shown to reduce mortality. And it's primarily by reducing the iatrogenicity. Limited tidal volume in LDS or in respiratory failure, non-invasive ventilation to avoid endotracheal intubation or prone positioning in severe LDS, but this is still debated. Selective digestive decontamination, debated. Corticosteroids in septic shock, still somewhat debated. Early goal directed therapy, debated. So I reviewed some of the evidence recently in critical care medicine. There is not much there. So ask yourself, what has been shown to decrease mortality in septic patients? And you will find that in the literature, the curves all look like this. So, decreasing iatrogenicity, yes, but new interventions. <laughs> Mortality may not be a right endpoint because many people in the ICU already have a history. They have comorbidities, they have other problems. And so, you know, at the end, you may say, well, let it go. And the patients can be dead or alive on the basis of a number of elements, not just the albumin that you gave or the transfusion that you gave. There are many other elements that will determine the patient's outcome. So we need to be concerned about this and say that the um, evidence is more complicated than just prospective randomized controlled trial. We still have uh, all these questions here without any answer. So that's the third big hurdle with these recommendations. The lack of RCTs showing a reduction in mortality. Now, let's go back to the basics. The VIP rule, what about the start of mechanical ventilation? Very important question. We don't want to wait for the respiratory arrest. We don't want to give it too early. What is in the guidelines on this? Nothing. So my colleagues and I in this article, which is open access, you can read it, emphasize that we need individualizing the need for and timing of endotracheal intubation. This is not in the guidelines. There is nothing on this. You need to consider the risks associated with delaying endotracheal intubation and the risks associated with early endotracheal intubation. Fluids. It's very disappointing in the guidelines, very disappointing. We all recognize that giving too much fluids is bad, but giving not enough fluids could be even worse. And we all know we need to individualize fluid administration. Why do people continue to suggest to give a given amount in three hours, in three hours? So this really does not make sense. We need to consider the four phases, salvage, 
you just open the bottles. Optimization before stabilization and de-escalation. So optimization is really very important. And a number of people like me would like to emphasize that this should be individualized. We cannot even suggest to give two liters in three hours because it may be not enough and sometimes it's too much. So people should know about the fluid challenge. If they are on call during the night, they need to know how to give a small amount of fluid and measure, interpret, and apply. It's not so difficult. So it's not give 500 cc's in 30 minutes. We need to say that. It is give a small amount in five, 10 minutes and assess the patient's response. So I hear wrong concepts about the fluid challenge. People don't do it well. You can read it again, it's open access. And optimally, you should have a cardiac output measurement. It could be by echo. It doesn't need to have a, a swan gun scatter. No, 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 no. But you need to measure the patient's response. You could use an internal fluid challenge by passive leg raising. It's a bit more complicated because the change in stroke volume will be very small and transient. Sounds easy to raise the legs, but it's not easy to appreciate the effect. And so, uh, you know, it's a stress also for many patients. I'm going fast because the time is very limited, but you should not look only at blood pressure if you do a passive leg raising test. So that's very important. If the patient is on mechanical ventilation, there's an arterial catheter in place, you could look at changes in pulse pressure variation, but this is in the operating room basically. Only if your patient is deeply sedated, paralyzed. Otherwise, no, 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 no. And just looking at the vena cava is not very reliable. That's another talk by itself. So we need to have a dynamic evaluation, giving a little bit of fluid and appreciating how the uh, patient's response to that. With COVID-19, there was a big issue with excessive use of diuretics. So the guidelines are also too much against things. I think that there, are, there may be a place for purification techniques. We don't know yet, but we should not suggest against them because otherwise people will not study them. They will say, oh, surviving sepsis campaign guidelines say, no, 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 we should not, ah, no. Wait a minute, there may be some things to explore. And perhaps we need to look at better defined patient populations, perhaps with a given range of uh, on the toxin levels in the blood. Intravenous fluid, there is not much in the current guidelines, but we should write and say that hyperchloremia is bad. And that implies that we should not give too much saline without checking the chloride levels. And people do large trials to compare saline with, uh, with uh, balanced fluids. That doesn't make sense. We need to individualize the type of fluids and measure what we do. It's as simple as that. So we need to recommend to be careful, to be careful with the use of saline, not to abandon them. No, 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 but to be careful and measure chloride levels. Likewise, albumin administration, there is plenty of evidence that colloid administration can reduce edema formation. That's clear. So there may be a place for albumin. Pump. Now we use vasopressors early, but what about the target? Studies like this would tell you that the target doesn't matter. You can use a lower or higher target. So if you apply this, you will say, okay, it doesn't matter. But it does matter. For the renal function, some patients may need 
a higher blood pressure than others. So we need to individualize this as well. And the guidelines here are wrong because they recommend an initial target blood pressure of 65. That's okay, but they don't say now that we need to reappraise it and individualize the blood pressure level. Init uh, at the last guidelines, we say it's initial 65, and then vasopressor dosing should be titrated to an endpoint reflecting perfusion. It was better than the current guidelines. It was better to say that we need to further individualize blood pressure. So that's what we wrote here. Some younger patients may be happy with a lower blood pressure. Some elderly patients, especially those with hypertension, may require a higher blood pressure. And that's what I call the noradrenaline challenge. Try and see what happens. But we need to tell people that with vasopressors, they need to give enough fluids as well. So you may also have to use an inotropic agent, something that the Japanese recommend in their recent guidelines. That's the dobutamine challenge. So we should not suggest against using levosimendan. Levosimendan may have a place, but in severe myocardial dysfunction, when blood pressure is well maintained, you see, we need to think a little bit more and be a little bit more precise. We also need to tell that measuring central venous oxygen saturation, yes, could be very valuable, not necessarily early goal-directed therapy, because uh, it was too simple. But checking the SCVO2, making sure that SCVO2 is not low in septic shock can be very, very useful. We should also clearly say that sedative agents should be avoided in shock. In the past, we used to give sedative agents to patients who were mechanically ventilated, all of them. But sedative agents actually can be very bad. And there are long-term consequences. Patients in shock usually sleep when you put them on the, the mechanical ventilator. The transfusions, if you analyze the literature, of course, there is no evidence that the hemoglobin level is an important element. But if the patient is in shock, be careful. It's not just the uh, hemoglobin level, but that's another you know, that's another concept by itself. I think time is running, so I will um, I will skip this and uh, emphasize at the end that we need to individualize the need for blood transfusions. And we recently showed that there is a possible place for transfusions in. Uh, severe shock. Oxygen extraction can go down, but oxygen consumption can increase. So you see there are many things we can propose. And um, finally, bundles based on guidelines are very bad, very bad. You try to do several things together, but the problem is, that you give too much time to people. In the past, it was within six hours to measure lactate levels. Six hours! <laughs> and then it was, uh, uh, you know, plateau pressure that should not be too high. But that's not within 24 hours, that's within 30 minutes. So our American colleagues, changed it and I said, oh, Jean-Louis, we will please you. Now we'll say three hours. No, and now Mitch Levy told me, Jean-Louis, you will be pleased. Now it's within one hour. You don't have one hour to measure lactate levels. Well, antibiotic therapy, you can argue, but in septic shock, one hour is too long. 
So we, you need to uh, really give antibiotics early when there is a, uh, a septic shock. But lactate levels, they should be measured within 10 minutes. And if the, there is a risk of uh, hemodynamic deterioration, you need to repeat the lactate levels. Some people call it lactate clearance. It's not clearance. No, 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 no. It can go up. And it's production more than clearance. But over time, you must make sure that lactate levels either go down or remain low. You don't need to measure lactate levels every five minutes, every hour to two hours. And this is not clear from the current guidelines. And begin fluid administration within one hour, within five minutes, you need to give uh, fluids. And likewise, vasopressors, you need to start early. And 65 is just the initial. Uh, target, you need to reevaluate it. There's a pressure challenge. So, really, the um, in the trauma field we have abandoned the golden hour of trauma because it leads to a waste of time. So, in trauma, it's over. In sepsis, it will be over, or it is over too. It's already there. Look at the paper by Derek Wheeler. It's open access. Is the golden age of the golden hour in sepsis over? So I'll give you 10 minutes to give uh, the basic uh, things. Okay, so uh, let me finish here because I think my time is, uh, is uh, over. I will conclude by saying that, saying that we treat patients according to the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines doesn't mean very much. It tells us more what not to do than what to do. And that's a big issue because we have very, a, a very small list of things that we should definitely do. So guidelines are good, but they have their limitations. We should not have a one size fits all approach. And we should always keep in mind that guidelines should not prevent individualized therapy and there are no recipes. I like to read guidelines on uh, lung cancer, as I said. I don't want to be treated by an ICU specialist who just reads the guidelines and applies them. I will not be treated well. But at three o'clock in the morning, if the person is tired and inexperienced, guidelines can really help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Thompson. You beautifully showed us that uh, despite these guidelines are uh, a very good objective uh, endpoints that we can strive for, at the end of the day, we must individualize care. And when we read these guidelines, we should not read it in black and white, but rather um, analyze it and see if it really is applicable for the clinical situation for each of our patients. Thank you, thank you very much. And we will continue with our second speaker, uh, Professor Luciano, Luciano Gattinoni. Um, Yes, thank you very much. Uh, he will be talking about the respiratory support lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, a professor of anesthesia in Germany. Uh, he is very well known for um, inventing the ECCO2 removal, the concept of baby lungs, the concept of mechanical power concepts. We are very happy to have you here. Please, you may begin your presentation. Good morning to everybody. Good morning, okay. it's already afternoon here a bit. Yes, let me start here. Okay. So, respiratory support. Let's see. Um, I, uh, let, this can slide you hear me? is not up yet, Professor. It's okay. The slide is not showed yet. Uh, just a second. There should be a green button in the. Yes, yes, I did it. Yes. 
Okay. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, but not the slideshow version. It's still small slides. Okay. Okay, very good. Good. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation. So the COVID, at least now in Europe, uh, is declining. But I think is a is a useful uh, reminder with what uh, Jean Louis said. We don't have to read a few instructions and uh, and do it blindly. And I think respiratory support uh, during COVID nineteen pandemic give us uh, some information about that. Let me try to explain my point of view. Let's see, we have uh, ARDS. As soon as we start with the COVID patient, they had uh, some bilateral infiltrates, uh, low PO2. So you say, okay, low PO2, you have uh, ARDS in this case, according to the bird def definition. Early RDS means protective strategy, and which includes very low tidal volume and uh, quite high peak level. And now, the RDS in uh, COVID has uh, some uh, little bit problem, and it's not an academic uh, uh, debate. We had an academic debate, but if COVID is a typical RDS, uh, we must have uh, a standard treatment. This was suggested by the guideline. As an example, surviving sepsis campaign at the beginning, some guideline coming from the National Institute of Health, they suggested to treat COVID according to the RDS guideline. However, if RDS is not typical, the treatment must be different. So is extremely important in any time we look at the therapy in intensive care to try to understand which are the mechanisms behind in that patient at that time. Let's see, what do we have in COVID-19 therapy? We have prevention, vaccine, nobody discussed, well, somebody discussed also the vaccine. Etiology, we may try to kill the virus. Now we have some possible to to, to fight against the virus directly, we may have some drug which interfere with the process that from the virus uh, arrive to the symptoms. And so we have anti-inflammatory, heparin steroids, and then we have symptoms. And the symptoms is respiratory support. Now, it's important to understand and to have very clearly in mind that all our respiratory therapy does not cure the patient. That means it does not interfere with the theology of pathophysiology, but just keep the patient alive. So it's a sort of defense to give the time to the other drugs or to the nature to fix the situation. So, Excuse me, respiratory support buys time. So the best we can do with the respiratory support is to provide the viable gas exchange at the lowest damage possible. So our goal is not to have a really good PO2, but a PO2 sufficient to maintain the patient alive without further damage. So the best we can have with respiratory support is to decrease the mortality due to the bad therapy we may provide or some wrong or some excessive therapy we provide. So it's different COVID-19 from the classic RDS. I concentrate in COVID-19 at early stage. As soon as the patient come, maybe after one, two days at home, the vast majority of the patient may come in hospital with hypoxemia and uh, with some, uh, some dyspnea, not all, because some, some patients come even not dyspneic. So we have a difference in uh, pathoanatomy. We have difference in respiratory mechanics. 
and we have differences gas exchange mechanism. At the beginning, this, which is a disease, is not a syndrome, is different from the typical sign of the syndrome we face with RDS. All these change with time. Now, briefly, let me remind what RDS very simply is. The classical RDS, we grow up in intensive care. We have pneumonia and sepsis. These are the two cornerstones. <clears throat> the other, the other etiologies are far more, more, uh, more rare, as inhalation, uh, some uh, immune disease, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So 80%, at least 80% of the patients in all the study we did in RDS uh, respiratory support come with pneumonia or with sepsis. So all our guidelines or suggestions <clears throat> in this uh, classical RDS are due to these two etiology. Now, at the end of the story, there is edema formation, not cardiogenesis, not primary cardiogenic edema formation. We have a small lung is left viable for the ventilation that we call a baby lung. And all the symptoms we have, the problem we have, and we try to correct with mechanical ventilation are due to the low dimension of the, of the lung because the lung mechanics has impaired. If I have to maintain normal gas exchange in a baby lung, I have to use an excessive tidal volume. The gas exchange is impaired because we have shunt. That means in the part of the lung which are closer, the lactactic or consolidated, the blood flow in there cannot be oxygenated. So it's a true shunt. And we have hemodynamic problem. The hemodynamic problem is extremely important and probably are neglected because we are able to maintain the hemodynamics with drug and fluids, but we pay a terrible price. Anytime we give a fluids to an RDS, the amount, the possibility of deteriorate or worse, <clears throat> the lung condition are very present. So this is the classical picture of the RDS. Now let's see COVID. Let's see the first way. During the first month, or the first of the first two months, I, we, we had uh, with Cumendo and so on, we look at some patients, not many patients, but who cares? We don't need two millions of patients in COVID-19 because they are equal. They are very similar because they have a disease and not a syndrome. And this patient had at the beginning a very strict characteristics. The compliance about 50% and the compliance greater than 50. After 40 years, I played with the RDS. I never saw so many patients with good compliance associated with extremely bad gas exchange with a shunt fraction, the venous admission, greater than 30%. Is this dissociation we should have tell us, wait a second, what you are doing, high peep and low tidal volume, this was the classical. <clears throat> Therapy at the beginning. You come with a patient hypoxy, you have a Pavlov reaction. I had to need it to increase the PO2. I put a helmet or mask or tube and I start to increase PEEP, as also suggested by the guideline of times, in a lung with good compliance. Good compliance means only one thing that the lung is full of gas. Look here. These are another series of patients of RDS, I think more than 100 patients, which we divided in, in a, few, in a in few, few groups. And you see this has been published, in the, I think it's an intensive care medicine. And uh, we have the patient who come with all with COVID-19, but some patient doesn't have the gas exchange infiltrates, okay, but the PO2 was greater than 30. Some patient uh, than 300. The patient are between 300 and 250, 250, 200, and below 100 here. So these are all the spectrum of no RDS, mild, mild, moderate, moderate, severe, severe. This is the gas exchange. Look at the anatomy behind the non RDS as exactly. The same amount of good lung tissue and the same amount, very modest, of non-aerated tissue, 
that had the severe COVID RDS. I'm still wondering how it was possible that so many of my colleagues were discussing this point. Is clear and everybody treating this patient tested and saw this reality. And how can you imagine to put in a patient with 50 or 60 of compliance that mean full of gas, 20 of people. For what? People is useful when you have to recruit. This patient have a very low recruitability. Recruitability is mean to do this one, to the non irrelevant tissue. When you reopen the lab. And of course, gas volume and respiratory system compliance are related. We know that since 30 years. I know that when a compliance is greater than 50, my gas volume is around uh, two liters, which is near normal. And this is an example of the COVID-19 patient taken at the same PO2 and PF, same FiO2 and same PO2, classical RDS pneumonia. This is a sternum. This is a long line, and this is the vertebra, and this is the COVID. And this is the amount of gas volume. And you see that at each level of the lung, the gas volume was almost the double in COVID-19 compared to the non-COVID RDS. If I have the lung full of gas, yeah. means that if I have an impairment of uh, if, I have an if I have an impairment of uh, oxygenation, that means I have only one possible mechanism. And this mechanism is uh, the perfusion. And uh, you see how, uh, as an example, is quite an uh, interesting example. In a normal RDS, these regions is hyperperfused. In COVID, is hyperperfused. These regions, normal RDS, usually good, well perfused and good gas exchange. Look here, it's completely empty. We have uh, now some uh, some patient I don't want to dissipate, but uh, some patient in which we did. Uh, with Busana, we did uh, the six energases to, to look at the, the gas exchange distribution. And it's very interesting. Here there are mechanisms in COVID RDS which are different. We have pathologic data from Ackerman who speak in a great increase as an example, the bronchial shunt in these conditions. So, the point is that if I use, if I just cure the PO2 with the classical system, big pressure, the only results I get is to have a problem with the kidney, problem with the hemodynamic, without any sense. Look as an example here, because I spoke about the early RDS. Look here, this is a patient supine, same patient in prone, and some patient in supine. And this is very similar to the classical RDS because we have a big density, density redistribution, and big recruitment, 40%. This is the patient with COVID, supine at five. You see the density are similar to that. But look here, in prone position, no changes, the density stay up, and the recruitment at the 35 pressure, zero, 0.1%. 0 what is the difference between this and even in the early RDS I spoke about? is time, because it's the rapid evolution maneuver. I cannot treat this patient as I treat this patient or the patient at this stage as I would treat the patient at this stage are different. 
we have to understand for each patient the mechanism behind. And look here, prone position and supine position in the same patient, prone five and supine. In this patient, we looked at the CD scan and we looked at the gas exchange and almost everything we could. And what we found that as average in this patient, prone position is very widely used, but as average, the PU2 does not change. Average. What means? That means in some patients, the PO2 increases on that, in some patient deteriorates. What is the difference between this status and this status? The average, if I put everything together, is equal. But average means not much if we do not understand, if we don't put the situation in its right framework. At the beginning, the patient is uh, without uh, great possibility to recruit. Then uh, with the time they go in intensive care, maybe the people give two liters, three liters or one. We start to develop edema. And then after the edema, we start to start the consolidation of fibrosis, etc. And the key role in the response to prosupine and to the PIP and the high pressure is the amount of tissue fibrotic consolidated. Let me give an example here. Let's imagine going to prone position that I have a patient which is only atelectatic. That means all the pulmonary units are closed, but are empty. All the problems are the interstitial part. It's a sort of limit. If I put this patient, the patient present like this, we have a collapse down because I have increased, uh, increased um, superimposed pressure. When I turn the patient up, this part open up, become here, and this part will collapse. The perfusion does not change too much in these two conditions. But as this amount is greater than this amount because of the lung shape, the PO2 goes up. Let's see, I have only consolidation. So I cannot open this part because the pulmonary units are full. I put in proposition, these units stay up. The weight of this lung compress this part of the lung. So I have decrease of PO2. In our series of patients, 50% increase their PO2 and 50% or did not change or decreased. So what we face is an intermediate difference degree between these two extreme steps. And we have to understand why this patient is there and where at which step I expect the patient to be. So when we published this one years ago, the beginning, we have a big debate, a lot of insults from some colleagues, huh? because we say, okay, we have some patient, let's call type L. Type L is not a, a basket when you put uh, the, the classification. It's just a word of communication, as the LDS is a word of communication. If I call my friend Jean-Louis and I say, I have a patient with type L, immediately realize that the black, the, the, this race is quite black. We have few infiltrates. Then the patient has a good compliance and the patient is hypoxic. If the patient is H, that means the compliance is low, the elastasis is high, the patient is severely hypoxic, and the lung weight is very high. Here, the lung weight is not normal, but no more than 200, 300 milliliters grams heavier than normal. Between this and this, the patient present, and the mistake we can do is to try to cure the PO2 as if it would have a classical LDS. So increasing P. P is tremendous in terms of hemodynamic impairment. Overall in patient with good lungs. Now, if the patient continue to breathe, and uh, the, this patient have a very strong inspiratory effort, we may have uh, the patient-induced lung injury. 
which deteriorate. Of course, the patient may also deteriorate due to the natural course of the disease. Some patients, the disease continue, but in some patients, they add damage to the natural damage. And by the way, the only thing we can do is to have drugs which interferes with the pathological process, which has, has cortisone as an example, or heparin sometimes, or I try to avoid the B inspiratory effort. So sedation of intubation in some patients. If the patient responds, decreasing the inspiratory effort with uh, CPAP of non-invasive ventilation, okay, no problem. But at the beginning, do you remember the patient for five, six days, breathing as a hell, maybe with CPAP, CPAP or helmet, maybe because it was not a place in intensive care. This is a tremendous. And now I think now the people is more prudent to use IP and so on in this phase. In this phase, we play the game. But remember, whatever we can do from the respiratory point of view is to provide the best, the, not the best, the, dam, the, the respiratory treatment, we have less damage together. So we have to always think in terms of possible damage. So in type A patient, patient like this, maybe have 50 or uh, maybe have a 40 or PO2. PU2 APF below 100. Where the blood goes? Remember the bronchial, the bronchial uh, uh, shan may play a, a, a consistent role. In, but in this patient, the only thing, if we, we have a non invasive support to avoid the big expiratory and avoid self in, to avoid self induced lung injury. And mechanical ventilation if the effort persists despite CPAP and flow non invasive ventilation. And of course, I should have a system to assess the inspiratory effort. We may have the esophageal pressure, you may have the uh, just, just as the central venous pressure swings, you can try to observe the patient to see the patient when they use additional muscles. To inspire to, for, to, for breathing. So these are the sign of a big inspiratory effort. Now, in this case, FiO2 as needed, tidal volume may be even lower than the higher than six if I had to avoid hypercap. Why not? I, I reach pressure which are pretty low because the compliance is very good in this kind of patient. And I put here 810 just for I don't know why. Because really, I should use around five just to counteract the effects of sedation and so on, the loss of tone of the muscles. But 15 or 20 are absolutely out of range. Prone position is okay as a rescue, but we have to, uh, to consider it. We have, as an example, one nurse and eight patients in this condition. You, uh, you don't have the time and the possibility to do something on that. Then, in type H, you have the classical RDS. But this happened at least between 10 and 15 days after the beginning. At the beginning, we are very far. And we have to still to understand how much of this picture is due to our treatment and how much is due to the natural cause of the disease. Anyway, the only thing we can do is to provide the, the treatment, which we know is less dangerous. And we have to avoid the big inspiratory effort at the beginning. So to conclude, because my time is over, <coughs> this is a sort of, uh, with arbitrary units, uh, a sort of uh, course, I mean, the lesson I learned from uh, this patient. Let's see, the recruitability and atelectasis at the beginning are very, very small, if any. And the mechanism of impairment of gas chain, which is the impairment of PO2 at the beginning, is due to different mechanisms than 
read the classical chant through the Lampard and Kim. And you have, with time, this may increase, we may start to develop the real edema. I'm wondering how much is made you associated to the treatment, to the means to the eye, and maybe to some uh, people who follow strictly the guideline. This patient looks sepsis, so give two liters of saline, and you develop atelectasis and edema at this point. And then the atelectasis are replaced by the fibrosis and the late stage P proposition and so on, everything is useless. The consolidation, the PCO2 and consolidation fibrosis, they goes up together. At the beginning, the PCO2 there is no problem. At the end, we have a very high PCO2 high the space and so on, because we have fibrotic process. And remember, what is the PCO2 that tell you the status of the lung structures? The lung structure changes and destruction is certified by increase of PO2, PCO2, not by the PO2. The PO2 stay always lower. The mechanism behind may change and the compliance, very good at the beginning, goes down. At each of these points, you have to provide the less dangerous treatment as possible. And thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, Professor Gattinoni. You showed us there uh, the course of the pathophysiology of the lung changes in COVID-19 ERDS and what, the, what our strategy for mechanically ventilating these patients can be. Thank you very much. I would like to invite our third speaker, last but not least, Professor Martin Westfall. Thank you for joining us. You will be talking about the race against the septic shark. Uh, professor Martin Westfall is a professor in Münster, Germany, an expert working on the field of sepsis and multiple organ dysfunction uh, in line with what you will be talking about today. Please, the time is yours, Professor Westfall. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Excellent. Then I would say, Selamat Siang. Good afternoon to everybody. And thank you very much for having me with you, with us together in this Indo Anesthesia Conference, which I enjoy very much and I'm happy to be part of it again. Now, you may wonder a little bit about this uh, title, uh, The Race Against the Septic Shark. And I would like to at least mention where it comes from. While I was attending also one of a round table meeting in, in Brussels where Phil Dellinger was tweeting about the treatment of septic shark. And he, I wondered septic shark, but of course he meant septic shock. It was just the accent uh, that confused me at that time. But nevertheless, I found this very interesting and thought further about it because there are some quite interesting similarities. So ladies and gentlemen, I hope you are ready for the race and I'm happy to guide you through my presentation. Well, first I would like to start a little bit with giving you some facts about great white sharks. Uh, they look a little bit scary. And I would like to inform you that these beasts are responsible for about 100 attacks on human beings per year. And that we also have about 10 cases that end deadly annually worldwide. Well, they are quite long and they are also heavy. And uh, those who have seen already one can evidence this. They swim quite fast. And you can imagine that this speed really gives them quite an advantage because they are dangerous if they attack you. They have also an impressive bite power. And even if you are not familiar too much with the unit of Newton, I can tell you it's a lot. And anyway, if it's 15,000 or 14,000, everybody is clearly not willing to get a bite from a shark. So there are also three principles to prevent potential deadly contacts with sharks. And these are clearly the avoidance, which is also true for sepsis. And that is definitely from my assessment, simply the best or the safest one. Then attention, so if they are around, one should be very careful, have a high level of attention to make sure there is no incident. Yeah, and if you need to escape, you need quite some speed and I can only say good luck. So maybe this is not possible and other uh, strategies here are more important in this regard. 
if we now build the parallel with sepsis, what can we say? Well, sepsis and septic shock account for millions of deaths every year. And there is even some quite statistics showing that there is someone dying from sepsis about every three and a half seconds on a global level. There are really a lot of people suffering from this. So about 30 million people are affected worldwide on an annual basis. And you know that once it's getting severe, it's best to be in a hospital and to receive an early, well-defined treatment. And these treatment principles are not so much different from what I was mentioning before when avoiding shark attacks. Number one, clearly, we need to prevent this wherever possible. So good concepts should be established everywhere to reduce uh, the incidence where possible. And there are a lot of international activities ongoing. If you have to deal with such a situation, first of all, you need to have the best possible diagnosis and then start treatment with appropriate algorithms as quickly as possible. And you really need to pay attention to this. And it's also self-evident that one wants to correct the underlying problem with speed, also as highlighted by Professor Vincent in his first presentation. So why waiting hours if a problem is there, try to fix it as quickly as possible. And what about the avoidance? Well, this is clear. I mean, if we can avoid a problem, we always want to apply it. Uh, it's the same with accidents. Why getting into an accident and fix the problem afterwards, the best is to avoid it from the beginning. And this is why there are a lot of professional societies uh, really having strong efforts here in trying to reduce this uh, topics and hygiene, microbiology clearly plays an important role. Now we have learned this during the COVID situation. We're wearing masks and really paying particular attention to hygiene measures has helped us to avoid other problems such as flus, which were not occurring to that degree any longer. So a clear goal is here to reduce the global burden of sepsis because with that, we can save lives. This is without any question. That means that the attention can clearly decrease mortality and we all should be alerted. We need to have a look at the patient, see if a state is deteriorating and then define measures as quickly as possible. So an early diagnosis of sepsis has shown to improve survival and this should be a clear goal and attention from all of us. One question that arises here is how to identify the problem best. And I would like to go a little bit back to the history where we have taught that this so-called SERS criteria uh, would be very easy to identify the problem, which might be the case, but they have problems of their own. And you remember that the focus was on the temperature change, heart rate change, uh, tarapnea, and also changes in the white blood cell count. Well, clearly, while there were the advantages of being very easy uh, to be assessed, there are also quite some disadvantages because not every patient with sepsis fulfilled the SERS criteria and vice versa, not every patient with positive SERS criteria has sepsis. So that was about the sensitivity and specificity problem. And there was also an early resistance and one of our uh, ones that raised his voice early and that was quite some time ago is with us today. And he clearly said at that time, dear sirs, I'm sorry to say that I don't like you. And I think he had good reasons. And as one example, he was focusing on the sensitivity problem because that might not help us to understand also the pathophysiology and also not helping our clinical trials and the clinical assessment um, as a whole approach to the, to the problem. So in the end, not very helpful in clinical practice and that's why it was challenged whether or not they would be needed at all. And it took quite some time to really evaluate this problem or this challenge in more depth. And there was a large trial with more than 109,000 patients with infection organ failure. And there were analysis going on with patients having at least two or more, two source criteria and less than two. 
And they were identifying the following, namely that about 88% were SERS positive and 12% SERS negative. So what does this imply in the end is that the need for two or more SERS criteria to define severe sepsis or septic shock excluded one in eight otherwise similar patients with infection and organ failure. And with this really was a substantial problem because it also did not really help to define a transition point in the risk of death. So what resulted from this? Bye-bye to SERS. And I think that was a pretty good decision. And this resulted also in this third international consensus definition for sepsis and septic shock to be more precise, to be a little bit better in guiding the, the diagnosis finding. So you may recall, hopefully, that sepsis is now defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. And the previous term, severe sepsis, becomes superfluous because now it's, it's sepsis. So that is made much easier as of today. It's also important to always identify organ dysfunction. And we have our dear SOFA score with us and a, a acute change in the score of at least two points is indicative of organ dysfunction. Just to remind you that it's easy and important to look at the respiratory system, coagulation, liver, central nervous system, and also renal function. What is also an easy tool to help you getting your first impression at the bedside is the so-called quick sofa, which is based on an increased respiratory rate of more than 22 per minute, an altered mentation, so if the patient becomes getting weird, confused, or also a drop in systolic blood pressure of less than 100 millimeters of mercury. So for this very quick and early assessment, no laboratory tests are needed, but it's important that you have a look at the patient at the bedside, which is always of highest importance and relevance. Then septic shock is a subset of sepsis with the underlying circulatory and cellular or metabolic abnormalities that are pro profound enough to increase mortality substantially. And also as highlighted in previous talk, it's important to start with something, for instance, to target mean arterial pressure of at least 65 millimeters of mercury and then titrate the therapy onwards and also have a look at lactate levels. Because if you give enough fluids, these should not further increase. If they do, there might be a problem and that should be further evaluated. But I would also like to remind you here at this stage that neither the SOFA or the quick SOFA is a standard loan tool for defining or identifying patient with sepsis. So always have a clear look at the patient at the bedside and also observe changes um, in the trajectory of the patient. What about attention? Well, the attention means that it's important to have an early diagnosis. Well, it could be in accordance, it should be with the new definitions because they ease the identific identification, but it's always important that you understand the underlying problem and have a look at the pathophysiology of each individual patients without grouping them, without being too general. So every patient has its own characteristics and also the own dynamics. And it's self-evident that the more experience is there on a physician's level, the easier it is to identify the patient at risk and to define a good treatment to correct the underlying problem as good as possible. So an early attention may be in an ICU, but in general, you need to have a focus on the patient and particularly if there is a deteriorated state, it's very important to have a close look and to get an idea if the certain therapy that has been started needs to be adapted. This is absolutely crucial. 
Well, there are some studies showing that an early ICU admission might improve outcome. Yeah, but I think the key thing is that one has a clear attention and the personal taking care of the respective patient. There are two important aspects relevant for sepsis treatment. And I just would like to give some information on antibiotic therapy and followed by supportive fluid therapy. I would like to refer to a trial, which is a retrospective court analysis, which I personally liked because it gave some idea of an inappropriate empirical antibiotic therapy for bloodstream infection based on discordant in vitro susceptibilities. What does this mean? What has been found here? So that was a quite huge retrospective analysis uh, from 130 US hospitals. And the key thing here of this study is that 19% of patients received discordant imperial antibiotic therapy on the day one of first blood culture collection. This is maybe not too unexpected if we do a blind fly based on our assumption, but I think this is a pretty interesting finding because the investigator also noted that there was a, that the discordant empirical antibiotic therapy was independently associated with increased risk for mortality. And that infection with antibiotic resistant species strongly predicted receiving discordant empirical therapy which I think is quite easy to understand, but this is absolutely reflected here by the study, which concluded that an early identification of bloodstream pathogens and resistance probably improves population level outcomes. At least it's pretty likely. So what about the timing of antibiotic therapy in the ICU? Well, the timing of these antibiotics in patients with life-threatening infections, including those with sepsis and septic shock, is now recognized as one very important determinant for survival of this population. And this has also been highlighted in the first presentation. Any delay here could have a negative consequence, which is self-evident. And that this is doubling mortality can also be understood. So if there is a problem and you wait to see, and maybe you decide here and there and cannot conclude, you may lose important time that could be detrimental. And of course, it's important that you have the appropriate antibiotic regimen at hand and you should need your conditions in the ICU work closely together with microbiologists to get an assessment what might be the right strategy for your hospital in a specific patient population, because this can make a difference and have a clear impact on survival in the end. So not only is an empirical antibiotic administration important, but the selection of the agent is even more important. Now what might be important is also to have a differentiated look on the general population of patients with sepsis where taking time might be needed a little bit to gather some more information to make the right diagnosis to confirm it and then to have the best possible treatment. But if there's a critically ill patient with suspected sepsis and signs of shock, you need to be fast. You need to be very fast in order not to risk losing the patient in the end. And I would like to give here some example with regard to changes in the recent um, guidelines that had also been briefly addressed before. And I'm highlighting here the changes as compared to a previous version. So for adults with possible septic shock or likelihood of sepsis, there should be an immediate start of the antimicrobials and ideally within one hour. And you have heard it before, don't wait too long and don't take the last five minutes of the hour. If you have a clear understanding of what is ongoing, then be fast. For adults with possible sepsis without shock, we suggest that there is at least a time limited course of a rapid investigation. I don't want to mention here again, the time that is mentioned, but it's clear. If you're not certain, well then try to be certain as quickly as possible and then start with the treatment. 
And there's also mention here that for adults with a low likelihood of infection and without shock, well, they differ from antiviral microbiotes. And the reason I have been shown you before, because doing the wrong thing might also not be right per se. Uh, I think this is a quite logical implication here that has been brought on paper. So to make this very short, for the antibiotic therapy with a high likelihood of sepsis, yes, keep calm, don't get nervous, but be fast. And be fast as much as you can. What about the supportive fluid therapy? I also would like to give you some highlights and Professor Marcel has addressed it. There was a previous recommendation of giving at least 30 milliliters per kilogram of IV crystalloids with a strong uh, level of evidence. And this has been downgraded to a, a low level of evidence as of today. I would say again, please have a look at the patient. Stay at the bedside. Have a smart approach. Track what you're doing and correct or modify, adapt wherever needed. There is not one fitting all concept. We have to deal with individuals and individuals require an individual adaptation. What they also highlight here this time is the use of capillary refill time. Yeah, it's very easy. It's very pragmatic. You can do it at the website. And of course, if you have a look at the microcirculation as reflected by this capillary refill time, then you also get an idea. So the key thing is have a physiological approach to the patient and have a look at the patient. There was a discussion already which kind of crystalloid uh, might be the best and I would like to make this story short. So there was a big trial going on with more than 15, close to 16,000 patients and a lot of them had also uh, sepsis. And what was noticed here that obviously the use of a balanced crystalloid had some advantages as compared to the normal saline group. There were also uh, less adverse kidney events and also there seemed to be some advantages with regard to vasopressor free and renal replacement free days. The bottom line, however, is that you should again have a look at the patient. If the patient suffers from hypernatremia and hyperchloremia, why should you withhold normal saline? On the other hand, if there is already a very high chloride concentration in the blood of the patient, sure, use a balanced crystalloid solution. So please don't take this concept for granted that they fit for everybody. I think they get some, give some quite interesting ideas what one should pay attention to, but one size does not fit all. So with regard to the hemodynamic management highlighted in the latest surviving sepsis campaign guideline, they say here for adults with sepsis or septic shock, we suggest using a balanced crystalloid instead of normal saline. But I have mentioned some arguments before. They also recommend against using artificial colloids and here they uh, recommended now also against using gelatins. I'm not talking now about all the vasopressors, but we know that epinephrine is the number one vasopressor and dobutamine as an inotrope. But I think again, one should be careful not to clearly recommend all other agents because there might be a role particularly if the catecholamines are not working anymore and there might be then a very effective and good alternatives. You've also heard about the discussion about the early goal-directed therapy where there were three large trials subsequent to the river study and they all came to the conclusion that there is no difference between the treatment and control groups and of course, a question that arose from that was, was all the research with early goal-directed therapy just for nothing and a waste of time, 15 years of evaluation? And I would say, no. One should, to be, one should be smart and have a clear approach to that topic and understand what has been shown. And what is important here is 
that the mortality rates also in the control groups has dropped significantly. And if you have a look at the figures, you can notice that the in-hospital mortality in the control group of the river study many years ago, 2001, was much higher than 90-day mortalities observed in other trials. So what does it mean? It means that treatment has improved over time. This is what made the decrease in mortality. And we should understand this. We have also heard about, for instance, respiratory strategies, the avoidance of iatrogenic problems. This makes a huge difference. And we have learned also on the way applying certain treatment strategies. So it could also well be that this early hemodynamic stabilization just became the new standard. I mean, who is waiting before optimizing a patient? I think this is just the new way of doing things today. So that's why the drop of the mortality rate could be interpreted as a success of medical education, also clinical teaching, and the bedside observation of the patient. It can also be that a maximum effect of a certain intervention has been reached. There is a maximum to everything. And once this has been achieved, no further optimization is possible. And what I also would like to briefly refer to is, also Professor Vincent touched a little bit in his talk, is the so-called large trial disease. And this effect should not be underestimated. So what does that mean? If you have large pragmatic trials and you compare a study group with a control group, you always have subpopulation in each group that benefit where there is no effect and where there is harm. And you can imagine if you bring this all together, there is no difference. And if you combine or compare no difference with no difference, there is no difference. It's as easy as that. But what is the learning out of that? It's not about complaining. No, I think we need to better understand the underlying dilemma and to apply it to the way forward. And it's about detecting those patients who benefit from a certain intervention and focus on this. Try to understand this better and evaluate this afterwards because this might be the respective treatment that could add value. So if no individual therapeutic targets are set in a pragmatic trial, I guess a positive result in the overall outcome may also not be expected and is very often not seen. And we need to be extremely careful that this does not translate into the wrong conclusion that all interventions are meaningless. And I would really like to emphasize this here and remind you that the overall death rate of our critically ill patients has reduced tremendously over the last decades. And this not because everything does not matter. No, things matter very much. And there are quite some good intervention that had been tested negative in these very large trials. And we should not come to the conclusion that everything that we have done before is meaningless. No, this was helping to advance medicine. And we should apply rational physiological based concept to guide our therapy of the individual patient. And you've also seen this today, and I like this, that we should come up with smart concepts for fluid resuscitation that takes into consideration the respective phase of the shock. I don't want to repeat what has been said before, but what is important here, that the amount of the fluid administration and also the withdrawal must be adapted to the phase of shock. It can well be 
that quite some fluid is needed in the beginning to rescue the patient, to optimize and stabilize the patient. But once this improved level has been achieved, it's clear you have a positive fluid balance. That was needed to rescue the patient. But we also know that an overall positive fluid balance is disadvantage advantages. And this is why we need to focus then on the de-escalation and think about strategies to get rid of this excess fluid again. I think this makes complete sense. So how do we win the race against this septic shark in the end? And I would like to summarize as follow. So first of all, the avoidance is the clearly best strategy. If a problem in general, and this goes far beyond sepsis, can be avoided, then please do so. If a problem occurs or is close to you, you should have a clear attention. We need to define the diagnosis. We have to have a diagnosis and then establish a treatment. And with that, we need to be fast. We need speed. And please don't get misguided by numbers of hours mentioned. This is just giving an orientation, but your challenge should be to be always as fast as possible that you win the race and not only you, but you win it together with your patient and the patient will thank you. And once you have done it, I think it's also time to enjoy the victory. And it's not always easy to have a victory against this beast. Sometimes we also lose, but once we win, we should also be proud of that. And of course, the patient will be very thankful to you. So this is clear, tactics matter here. And my personal conclusion is and remains, and this is independent of guidelines, is that if there is a problem, fix it as soon as possible, because we need to avoid consecutive collateral damages. And please also don't get paralyzed by the analysis. So don't think too much and act because otherwise we might create a problem that wasn't even there in the first place. And please be reminded of the iatrogenic problems that might occur if we do intervention that are really not helpful. So I would say all in all, we have a chance to win the race against the septic shark, we just need to be smart enough. And I also would like to finish now with a very good quotation from my point of view, namely that now is no time to think of what you do not have. Think of what you can do with what is there. And this also applies to any kind of crisis, to drug shortages, availabilities, etc. So sometimes we need to be creative and focus on the solution. And definitely, I wish you a very nice shark free remaining day and kindly thank you for being with us and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Westfall. It was a great review on sepsis. We should avoid it at all costs if we could. If it happened, we should recognize it early and at treating it, we should be timely in uh, treating each individual patient. This also is in line with the presentation of Professor Fonsong that one size does not fit all. We should always look at our patient at the bedside to determine the best course of treatment for the patient. So I would like to invite all three speakers here. Uh, we already have some uh, questions in the Q&A box. I think I would like to start with one question that I think all speakers can give um, comments on. A uh, question from Dr. Arif, he asked about um, the, or the, the one hour bundle, the first treatment that we are going to give the patient. Uh, very often when the patient came to us in the ICU, the patient has already been resuscitated like in the ER or in the ward. So we don't always have this record, how many fluid has been given to the patient. What would your strategy be in this kinds of patient? Do you start with small boluses of fluids first 
or do you go with vasopressors or do you have you know any other strategy that you will do for this uh, patient maybe we can start with professor fonsong please yeah i hope you can uh, hear me yes very uh, good the answer is it doesn't matter where the patient is the patient location uh -oh. you need to treat the patient as the problems are, as uh, uh, we just heard in the last presentation, uh, re-examine the patient, make up your mind. If you think that the patient may benefit from fluids, try a fluid challenge. The patient may have received two liters, three liters, who knows? Some patients with peritonitis may need more than three liters of fluid, and some patients with pneumonia may have too much with one and a half liters. So individualize your therapy, and this should come from a careful bedside examination, as Professor Westphal emphasized very uh, rightly. So um, uh, if the patient is profoundly hypotensive, yes, we need to start vasopressor agents right away. But this should not prevent us from trying some fluids to see if the patient may benefit. Even if there is only one chance out of 10, don't miss it. Because that could really help one patient out of 10. That's good. That's not bad to try. But if the patient does not benefit, stop right away. Don't say, well, let's start another litter and we will see. That's bad medicine. That's yeah. not what we were uh, taught to do in the intensive care unit. Individualize your therapy is the right answer. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Westfall, do you, do you have any comment about this? Well, I would say that was already a very holistic answer, but clearly, do something, track it, track it. You need to, you need to control if your measure is helpful. It's about the hemodynamics. It's about lactic values. It's an interplay of everything. And don't focus on one organ all, only. That's clear. But this has been highlighted before. I would say this is this is the right way. And definitely, don't be too much afraid what might have happened before. You can also not anticipate the future. But once you have received a stable situation then please don't forget to de-escalate also. And just okay. don't have the misconception not to change a winning team because there is an end of the winning strategy and you need to adapt it again to continue the win. Mm. Okay, okay, very good. I think I would like to expand this question to another one. Uh, still regarding fluid therapy, what do you think about the use of 5% albumin in fluid resuscitation in sepsis? Uh, maybe we start with Professor Fong Song. Yes, indeed. Well, my talk was not on that. My talk was on the guidelines, and uh, the guidelines do not say much. Again, because prospective randomized controlled trials have not shown mm -hmm. that albumin can decrease mortality. But these trials have never shown that anything decreases mortality, except, again, as I mentioned, prone positioning in severe RDS, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, and limited tidal volume, not only in the RDS, no, 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 in mechanically ventilated patients, because there is always a risk of uh, volotrauma if we use excessive tidal volumes. So, uh, uh, okay, so with respect to albumin, there is a very good rationale for giving albumin to patients who have edema, and hypoalbuminemia. You know, there is a whole lot of literature on this and a lot of uh, basic science indicating that the addition of some albumin can decrease oedema formation. This evidence is very, very clear. So you may say, I don't care about oedema. Well, okay, but I do care about oedema in the lungs, in the kidneys, in the gut, in the brain, oedema is always bad. And so some colloids may be useful. Right now, people discuss only albumin, 
but you know, I'm not convinced personally that hydroxyethylene starch is so toxic. No, the evidence doesn't show that. So, you know, if it's less costly, some people may prefer to use some, not lots of, but some hydroxyethylene starch, and you could use some albumin. It doesn't mean pouring albumin into the patient, but some colloids indeed may be very useful. And again, here, try to consider the individual patient. Just to take an example, think at the patient with cirrhosis, who is coming with septic shock. You know that this patient has a very low albumin level. You know that this patient has hypooncosity. Isn't it logical to uh, increase the mm -hmm. colloid osmotic pressure of this patient to reduce the oedema formation? It makes so much sense that it doesn't need much discussion. Okay, okay, thank you. Professor Westphal, do you have any uh, anything to add on this? Yeah, I think we also should, of course, always take into account that in such a situation where a colloid might be needed, and you talked uh, clearly about albumin here in the setting, is that there is capillary leakage. And we also know that capillary leakage is not easy to assess at the bedside, but we see it. Mm -hmm. We see it. I mean, we see it in the lung function particularly, but also in other organs. And definitely, we have to con continuously evaluate this to see about the effectiveness. And we know that crystalloids distribute easily in the extracellular space and remain much shorter in the vessels as for instance, a colloid. And therefore in certain situation, definitely a clear role. One should have again, a physiologic approach to this problem. And with that, it's clear that it should be also part of treatment options. Okay, okay, but still on regarding the initial resuscitation, can you explain to us, there is a question in the audience. Um, why doesn't the, um, the guideline uh, recommend starting vasopressin right away? Uh, why does the guideline recommend more epinephrine as an initial um, uh, vasopressor of choice and use vasopressin later when that fails? Uh, do you have any comment about this? Yeah, maybe also one, one other comment before. The question is also, do we need to expect that a single intervention is decreasing mortality? Is this the right expectation we should have? I think that became pretty modern in last years, but maybe we also need to cal cali calibrate ourselves again because this is a supportive measure. And then coming back to your question with the vasopressin, I think, of course, we have the most experience with norepinephrine. Mm -hmm. And we should also not forget that is we need both. We need to have a, a good blood pressure, but we also need to have an appropriate flow, which is important for organ perfusion. And at least with norepinephrine, you have not this drop in cardiac output, which might happen with vasopressin. That's why I believe also trying the other one first is logical. If this is not enough and you have a massive vasoplegia and you cannot stabilize the patient enough with norepinephrine and need escalating doses, although you have given already fluids, then definitely it's worth to think about alternatives. Um, other more um, st or stronger vasopressor agents and there is also quite some data out there that with that you can stabilize the patient. But you always need to have a look at the whole picture and don't forget the flow because that is crucial. And if you have extremely high doses, you might also shut down the microcirculation and create other problems. And this is why it's, it's really important. And I think it's, it's the right recommendation as we have. Okay. Uh, Professor Fangson, do you have any comment about this? Oh yeah, I, I could speak about it for one hour, but uh, I, I will slightly disagree with Professor Westphal's comments and then I will agree with them. I'll slightly disagree with the basic idea that vasopressin is not another vasopressor. 
Of course, it has vasopressor activity. That's why we call it vasopressin. But it's not just one versus the other. To me, and I wrote a paper on this many years ago, vasopressin is a hormone. And we use it because we think there is a relative vasopressin deficiency. And that was shown 20 years ago. And vasopressin deficiency in septic shock. And so the rationale is to replenish this and to give low doses to uh, compensate for this problem. So if you use vasopressin, it is at low doses and not to replace noradrenaline or you know, any other vasopressor. Where I fully agree with Professor Westphal is that we need to look at flow. And the problem is that some people give vasopressin, they see the blood pressure coming up and they say, oh, fantastic. But the patient is getting vasoconstricted. So that's bad, very bad. You know, look at strong vasopressors like metaraminol or angiotensin. If you use it indiscriminately, if you use it without thinking further, you may end up with a very vasoconstricted patient. Phenylephrine is the same thing, very dangerous. So we showed with a uh, Brazilian group that in patients with hyperkinetic shock following cardiac surgery, the administration of vasopressin could improve outcomes after cardiac surgery when there is vasoplegia. Vasoplegia, vasoplegia means low blood pressure, but normal or high cardiac output. That's what vasoplegia is. Hypotension and vasoplegia are not the same words. And I hear some people around the world saying, oh, the patient is hypotensive in sepsis, that's vasoplegia. No. Remember the old times where people were speaking about warm shock and cold shock? You know, that was yeah, bedside examination. Some patients with sepsis can be vasoconstricted. Don't give vasopressin to a patient who is vas who is vasoconstricted because that can be very harmful. Make sure that the patient is vasodilated. You know, there was a vasopressin derivative. Uh, Professor Westphalt knows it very well because he has worked on this as well. It's called celepressin. And we started using this new molecule with big success, less oedema formation, because that's what vasopressin derivatives could do. And at the end, when we had to start a large trial, the company said, oh, don't look at hemodynamics, just use it as a vasopressor. We said, no, we are not going in that trial. My name is not on that paper, which showed no difference in outcome, hopefully not a harmful effect, but no improvement in outcome because there was no hemodynamic measurement. People did not care about cardiac output. It's very dangerous to give a vasopressor to patients who have a low cardiac output. Be sure that the patient is vasodilated before you increase your vasopressor therapy. It's really basic medicine, but people sometimes forget about basic medicine. Okay, that is correct. We sometimes uh, look at guidelines and just apply them instead of looking at how the drug works and what the patient's condition is. Can I also invite Professor Gattinoni to uh, make a comment about this, about uh, fluid resuscitation and um, vasopressor of choice in initial treatment? I'm sorry, Professor Gattinoni, I think you're still muted. Well, I think Jean Louis and Martin already said everything. Is uh, my only point is about the guidelines in general. The guidelines are the minimum common denominator of a lot of people that have to have find an agreement, and the agreements are always a compromise, and we don't take care of every patient with compromise. So I perfectly agree with that. This is a normal common sense, eh? and uh, it's better than nothing but is far from being the best, I think. Anyway, and sometimes are very wrong. Uh, but uh, anyway, about the resuscitation, about 
there are a few words about albumin. I think albumin for resuscitation in sepsis, when you have a, a capillary problems, uh, is, um, is not extremely used. We know the total amount of fluids in this phase, at least in the study we did in more than 1,700 patients with the Albio study, we found that the amount of fluid was the same at the beginning between uh, albumin and no albumin. But in severe sepsis at the time, was well, defined like this, uh, we found a significant difference using albumin. So I think are the extra fluid albumin action that uh, the game is played because albumin is not just uh, to keep the water in the capillaries. I remember that we have different uh, regions of the, of the lung in which the permeability of the albumin is completely different from zero to 100%. Zero in the brain, 100% in the liver, 60% in the muscle, 60% in the lung. Albumin is a little soldier which takes care of the extracellular fluids going in the vessel and outside the vessel with a lot of action. So I think we have quite, a, I mean, I'm personally convinced looking at the data we have uh, that albumin may play, may play a role. To my brother in septic shock, uh, I would give albumin. That's it. And uh, for the rest, uh, I don't have much to add. Okay, great point, great point. Um, do you have any feedbacks for Professor Wesco or Professor uh, Ponsan about Cardinoni? Yes, please. Uh, 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 yeah, Professor Gattinoni does not refer to the data of his study. His study showed that people receiving albumin had less edema formation. They required less fluids for resuscitation. And when you put all these studies together, I'm speaking about prospective randomized control trials, you can see a clear reduction in the amount of fluids needed when you use colloids instead of crystalloids. It, it, it's another talk by itself, uh, but you know I can show you all these data and they are quite clear. So the physiology works. Some people say, oh, the uh, capillaries are so leaky that everything goes into the interstitium. Of course, there are permeability alterations, of course. But look at the blood albumin levels. They still go up you still increase the uh, albumin concentration in the blood compartment. You cannot say that everything leaks out. The patient would be dead if there was no capillary barrier any longer. So there are alterations in capillary membrane, but there may be holes in, uh, in your plate. Uh, you may still have to add some soup if you, if you want to eat something, even if there is a leak, you know, you can still benefit from the soup you pour in your bowl. Professor Gettinoni, please. Well, as usually, it depends on the degrees. In a big studies, no, you have patients with different degrees of permeability and so on. I mean, I don't think the health of liters uh, after two days makes a great difference. But I think that albumin is made not only or not primarily to keep uh, the, the blood in the vessels. You know, let's see that I, I may, let uh, try to, what is the, or the famous oncotic pressure, right? The oncotic pressure is at 25 millimeters of mercury. Do you know why we speak about the osmotic pressure uh, in, in uh, osmotic concentration when we speak about electrolytes and oncotic pressure when we speak about proteins. The oncotic pressure is the osmotic pressure due to the protein. Now, the osmotic pressure of the protein is about 2.5 versus 300 in the oncotic of the osmotic pressure. is almost nothing. If we imagine that you have a, a complete uh, shift of the albumin from one side to the other side, this include a shift of water of about 500 milliliters, no more. So we have to take the pencil and to make a count and agree with Jean-Louis, 
if you take, if you give a lot of albumin and you measure the albumin before and you measure the arm immediately after and you have an idea of the volume of this patient or the blood volume, you can make your computation. But nobody does that. We gave tons of albumin without measuring the albumin before and after. And this will be clear cut answer to your question. That's it. Okay. Uh, Colorate osmotic pressure. That's what is due to large molecules like albumin. Yes. And colorate osmotic pressure regulates the fluid exchange between the blood and the extravascular compartment. That's what Starling showed in his peripheral Starling equation. You know, oncotic pressures opposing to hydrostatic. Louis, it seems to me to me to have heard something like that. The, the osmolarity regulates the osmolarity. Osmolarity regulates F and extracellular water. My God, in the cells and the extracellular compartment. That's That's right. You know, Jean Louis, can you tell me how much is the, oncotic, the osmotic pressure? May, how may much is the osmotic pressure? May I finish? Pressure, not concentration, pressure. I how think much I'm is the osmotic pressure? Osmolarity regulates. No, no, I know. Uh, tell me how much is the osmotic we are, pressure? Here, need, we have an audience here. Let's return to basic physiology. Okay, osmotic. anyway, the basic physiology tell you I that osmotic pressure is 5,000 <laughs> millimeters of mercury. Not three, not the 25, five. This is what happens when we put okay. three experts in the same floor. Right. Everyone argues and everybody has many ideas. You cannot change them. Osmolarity regulates the fluid passage from the cells to the outside of the cells and vice versa. I know, I know. You give manitol to patients with intracranial hypertension to attract fluids from the cellular compartment into the interstitium. This is not the same as the large molecules remaining more into the intravascular space thanks to the colloid osmotic pressure. Go back to the basics, to the styling equation in the periphery. All right, Professor, I'm going to have to stop you right there because our time is limited and we have five minutes left for question and answer. But I think all your points there were good. Um, were good trigger points for us audience here so that we can uh, further learn about the use of albumin for fluid therapy uh, in septic patients. Uh, before we wrap up, there is one question I would like to address from the Q&A box. We still have about three minutes. And this question is about prone positioning for Professor Gatnoni. What do you think about um, external compression to in supine position to replicate prone uh, therapy. What do you think about this, please? Well, you know, this is a big, great discovery uh, in the last, in the recent months. Huh? However, I patent a machine to compress the chest wall anteriorly to substitute the prone position in 1996, so no, about 30 years ago. Up. Because uh, uh, there is a pattern you can check on the, you put Luciano Gattinoni patterns and you'll see it. Because there is nothing new about the sun. So I use clinically the compression, but not just to substitute from positions more complicated, you need a machine and so on. But as a test, when you have a patient in mechanical, see you are in volume control ventilation, you go to the patient and you compress the chest anteriorly. What do you expect? If I'm in volume control, I expect the pressure, the peak plateau pressure, the peak pressure goes up because I decreased. Now you will see that about 20, 30%, not in all of the patient, the pressure goes down. If I am in pressure control and I compress, I expect the volume go, um, go down. And sometimes you compress 20% and you see the, press, the volume goes up. What does it mean? I use as a test of predominant hyperinflation. Because if I compressing the chest wall, I improve the, 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 the situation, means 
that the lung volume is excessively distended. So it's very easy. I use that clinically since 30 years. When I see the patient, I press and I look at the airway pressure. And I know if the airway pressure goes up, uh, I, it's okay. If the airway pressure goes down, the lung is hyperinflated. So it's not a question to substitute from position and so on, because you have, of course, I have a pattern, but the machine has never been built, of course, because uh, it is really compared. I mean, it's easier to put in from position, but to understand what's going on, the mechanism, as usually are important, is an easy maneuver to detect in a single individual patient the hyperinflation. Doesn't cost anything. Very good, very good. That's new for us. And you already discovered this in 1996. That's quite a long time ago. In 96, I patented it. I discovered a little bit before. Ah, so okay. I never published, I never published anything about that because if you publish something, you cannot have a patent. So I came for myself, I did a patent. Ah. Then, but sometimes at the conference, I, I told that so many times. This is what, uh, what I do normally clinically. But you cannot, you cannot say that. You can imagine the reviewer no? saying, I compress it. They say, OK, how much was the force? How much was the, the, right. the, 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 the pressure of contact? Blah, 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 blah. So do it, and that's it. You can go okay. now, compress, and see it. That's it. We'll look up to it, Luciano Gattinoni's patents. Thank you very much, everyone. That's a okay. wrap for us. That concludes our session today. But before I close this up, uh, I would like to thank the committee and I would like to invite all the three speakers to stay a little bit more, an extra 15 minutes, because we will have Dr. Susilo and his band performing. I understand Professor Gattinoni, I heard you're a jazz pianist. I hope you will enjoy this. And I hope everyone had a good time in this noon session. I will give this back to Krisha. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank Come you, on, I know. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. It was good seeing you all. Good, good to see you, everyone. Yes, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.